Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the panel on conflict integration, a new strategy for building peace and transforming conflict. My name is Julie Werbel. I'm the Division Chief for Leadership and Learning in USAID's Center for Conflict and Violence Prevention in the new Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization. It's really a pleasure to be here today, especially with this um, panel of experts. We've talked a lot this week about how interconnected the challenges we face are, as are the systems that we seek to strengthen to manage and manage those challenges, be it health, education, justice and security, climate or other. One thing that we've clearly learned as a community is that stovepipe solutions will never overcome the challenges of a disrupted world. I've been really pleased to see how many of us have come to the same conclusion. But no matter how innovative or effective programming designed to prevent armed conflict and violence or to promote peace may be, it simply isn't enough. In addition to direct peace building programs, we need new ways to position sectoral programs to not only achieve key development goals, but to also realize peace dividends. Peace and development are inextricably linked, yet we continue to treat them as if one can be achieved without the other. For too long, the development community has treated armed conflict and violence like the weather, that is something that happens outside, but that doesn't affect our core sectoral programming. Reality we know is very different. When health workers are attacked by communities mobilized through disinformation, when violent extremist activity pushes farmers off their land, leading to food insecurity across the region, or when security sector assistance inadvertently erodes democratic governance, we owe it to our partners to ensure that we've integrated a conflict and violence prevention lens across all of our interventions. The peace building community has been reckoning with this challenge for a long time. But it's time for us to move from an advocacy campaign to an action plan. Within USAID, my office has begun to champion conflict integration to assist our field-based missions to both achieve their core development goals and support and sustain peace and stability. We have our first ever conflict integrator on staff, and we're thinking through many of the operational challenges associated with conflict integration, including navigating con congressional earmarks, measuring the effectiveness of conflict sensitivity, and overcoming interagency stovepipes. Our panelists today are making similar inroads to advanced conflict integration. They offer a mix of integration experience from both the headquarters and the field, as well as from donor and implementing partner perspectives. Um, so let me turn to them now. You have everyone's access, uh, you have access to everybody's bio on the uh, agenda. So let me just jump to our first panelist, Jonas Kleiss from the European External Action Services Directorate on the Integrated Approach for Peace and Security. Jonas, over to you. Thank you, Julie, and uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Good evening here uh, in Brussels. Um, so indeed, my name is Jonas Klaas. I'm uh, at the EU, EU External Action Service uh, within a division that's focused on conflict prevention and mediation. And previously, I spent uh, approximately 10 years at the US Institute of Peace. Uh, so I'm very pleased to see a lot of uh, familiar names uh, in the list of participants here. Good to see you all. Um, I'm very pleased uh, today to talk you briefly through our approach, the EU approach to conflict analysis, as I think it, it presents a good example of conflict uh, integration. As uh, Julie said, interconnected challenges like violent conflict really require an integrated response. Uh, and we feel that through close partnerships between both of our political and development uh, uh, units, uh, we've made some great strides towards integrated conflict prevention and uh, peace building. At the same time, I feel that our approach to conflict analysis is also a good example of putting conflict prevention commitments uh, from words uh, into practice, because uh, as we all know, um, um, realizing some of these commitments is often easier uh, said than done. So over the past two years, uh, I would say that our approach to conflict analysis has gone through quite a big uh, transformation. If you would ask me this question two years ago, I would have had to say that we conduct approximately two or three conflict analysis on an annual basis. Very long processes of six to eight months leading to PhD style dissertations that a few of my colleagues would uh, end, up, uh, end up reading. Um, 
and quite often when we uh, go out to uh, our delegations the equivalent of, of uh, a u.s embassy uh, to some extent uh, we almost, almost had to twist their arms to make sure that they would work with us uh, to ensure that we would be able to do these uh, conflict analyses and quite often we were on the bottom of uh, the list of, of their priorities now that has changed uh, quite significantly the uh, conflict analysis process that the EU uh, applies uh, and its final product has gone through quite uh, some changes. Um, so eight, uh, about 18 uh, months ago, when the EU started its new seven-year uh, budget uh, cycle, uh, set out in the so-called uh, Indiki uh, regulation, um, we noticed to our great surprise and positive uh, um, 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 surprise that was that um, conflict analysis was being proposed as a requirement, a requirement uh, to ensure conflict analysis was done in all conflict affected um, and fragile countries. So obviously, when we think about a list of fragile and conflict affected countries, that can be quite a long list. Uh, so in all of those countries where the EU engages in programming, a conflict analysis has to be done first before we can start with our programming cycle to ensure that that programming is uh, uh, provided in a conflict sensitive manner and that we've identified opportunities for conflict prevention as we uh, design our, our programming. And that was really a, a game changer for us when we went through more of a voluntary system of whoever's interested in doing this more towards making it a, a requirement um, the doors really opened up quite widely uh, to us. So in order to ensure a credible response to this new requirement, um, we developed a, a new methodology, which we obviously, there's not a hundred ways to do a conflict analysis, uh, but we coined this one conflict analysis screenings because it was particularly tailored at ensuring the conflict sensitivity of, of EU programming while also doing the traditional things a conflict analysis does, looking at structural cause of violent conflict and, and opportunities for conflict uh, prevention. Uh, and we did that very closely between the EAS and DJ INPA, which is our uh, development uh, um, branch. So over a period of approximately three years, we're conducting 60 of these conflict analysis screenings. Uh, at this point, 15 have already been uh, concluded. Uh, another 20 are currently ongoing. And um, so we're closely, uh, slowly uh, approaching the, the halfway mark. Uh, and many uh, times we are able to bring in not just EU member states in these analysis, but also our international partners, including the US um, embassy uh, based in, in a given country. So that's all from a very integrated uh, approach. Um, it brings in a lot of the different um, um, parts of, of the EU. So obviously the EAS with its diplomatic and, and political and security uh, mandates. Um, if in a country there's a CSDP mission, so the EU equivalent of, of a UN peacekeeping mission, and those are often, of course, uh, um, um, contributing. Uh, the development colleagues, humanitarian colleagues, uh, but also climate, uh, agriculture, and uh, the European Investment Bank are participating uh, quite regularly in these uh, joint analyses. So it's really putting the integrated approach, which is what my directorate stands for, integrated approach to security and peace, um, are really um, um, to work. All of these analyses, as I said, really have two key objectives, to ensure the conflict sensitivity of programming and to um, propose new opportunities for conflict prevention. So uh, towards the end of my, my brief remarks, I'll provide a couple of examples of what that has led to. Um, now, at the same time, as we continuously try to improve our methodology, we've also tried to ensure that the methodology that we apply accounts for different types of violence, because as was mentioned already in the introduction as well, um, obviously there's different conflict types to account for, violent extremism, mass violence, um, uh, hybrid warfare to some extent as well. Uh, so all of that needs to be encapsulated. Obviously most conflict being intrastate is what we focus on mostly. Uh, but there are still, obviously, as we notice uh, uh, these days and weeks, uh, uh, interstate uh, tensions as well that have to be accounted for by these analytical frameworks. So that has to be uh, accounted for. Um, so 
all of that um, um, has led to to these these changes. Obviously, I, I'm not here to just uh, paint a very rosy picture and and, and tell, give you a good news show. There are really big challenges that that remain. Um, there's not just how to translate the recommendations of your analysis into actual uh, actions and, and programming. That's a very difficult uh, exercise. Uh, making sure that the recommendations that you develop are actually tied to the key um, drivers that you've, you've identified. The dissemination challenge, on the one hand, we try to get this in as many hands as possible throughout the inst institutions primarily, but also our member states. But on the other hand, these are obviously very confidential documents and uh, our systems are always not up to speed as yet to, to, to balance that need for confidentiality and, and the need for wide dissemination. Um, and finally, uh, just make sure that, that the analysis that we conduct are always evidence-based. And I think this is an important point as well. Julie mentioned in the beginning the, the, the complexity of island conflict. I think when we do conflict analyses, often we tend to uh, go towards what our gut feeling tells us on what we think drives violent conflict in a given uh, country or in a given uh, region. Um, but we um, have commissioned quite a few um, um, literature reviews quite recently just to make sure that our methodological approach is actually in line with what the latest research tells us on what drives violent conflict and not just what we assume uh, that drives it. So that uh, way we tailor it uh, policy as well. The two final big challenges that I'll mention uh, that we continue to struggle with is when is it time to do an update uh, when you've gone through 60 analyses, um, when you've gone three months, four months down the road, <laughs> sometimes it's already uh, requiring to get, get an update uh, uh, done. So doing that within the means that you have within your uh, uh, available to you is, is really challenging. And then uh, doing monitoring evaluation of an analysis, like how do you measure impact of your analytical processes is, is very, very challenging. I'll conclude with a couple of very brief examples of what this has led to. Uh, our conflict analysis has certainly shaped our response to the coup in February in, uh, in Myanmar. Um, also, the uh, planning of our new CSDP mission in, uh, in Mozambique has also benefited greatly from uh, the conflict analytical uh, work. And regional analyses that we conduct uh, throughout the world. So there's obviously a lot of conflict spillover. Focusing on one country for conflict analysis doesn't always make sense. So making sure that we uh, adopt regional uh, focuses and, and look at that spillover uh, is, is something that uh, is, 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 is done through this uh, approach as well. I'll leave it at that. Um, hopefully this provided a bit of a HQ slash field perspective because many of these analyses are done uh, in the fields at, at our delegations. Uh, and very much look forward to uh, the presentations that my colleagues have in store for us. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Jonas. I'm sure uh, there would be more questions about the mechanics of this. There were already a few about um, how you streamlined it and, and uh, you mentioned how you update it. Um, and uh, the question that we all grapple with is how, how do we measure um, our work? Staying at the headquarters level, um, let me pass the floor to Jesse Anderson, who is the Senior Conflict Advisor for USAID's uh, Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Thanks, Julie. Um, so hi, everyone. I, I wanted to share a bit of a um, set of lessons learned, I would say, from a Washington perspective on promoting conflict integration across a, a couple sectors and in a pillar bureau in particular at USAID. And so I was going to briefly kind of touch on what I've found to be some necessary ingredients for success, um, what we're messaging uh, at a high level on conflict integration internally, and then some quick programming examples that relate with those messages. And then I will end on uh, ch challenges and, and what we're up to next. And I feel like the challenges could be a bit of a, a therapy session for me. So thanks for obliging. Um, so the necessary ingredients piece, I would say just, you know, I, I found this session fun. Um, I'm taking it in a slightly different direction, but it was actually nice for me to be able to reflect on in terms of what what did it kind of take to move the needle in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at, at USAID? And um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I said that first, but I am I'm um, the senior conflict advisor in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I left uh, the mothership, which was with Julie and, and company at what was CMM at the time and now CVP. And um, 
it's a unique role where I'm I'm embedded in a regional or sorry I'm embedded in a pillar bureau that has um, its own unique um, initiatives you know sectors and and I, I'm kind of sitting with them and, and marinating in that in a unique way. So I think leveraging critical junctures is one of those key um, necessary ingredients, and I think those come internally and externally. And then to me, what I found to be the next piece is having the right message at the right time within that um, critical juncture. And that really, to me, for when I'm working with sectoral colleagues is about how do we think about um, sectoral goals first, but then bring conflict integration into that? How do we, how do we sort of um, find ways to let folks know that peace really matters, but also it's not just about peace for peace sakes, it's about really meeting our sectoral goals in, in complex contexts. Um, then finally, and I think this is contentious because I, you know, my heart is in that transformative side to what we're doing. How can we actually get folks to be thinking quite differently about their work? But um, one thing I found is that those approaches that we're sharing with folks need to also include light touch ways of thinking and working differently, in addition to those wholesale transformative ways of working. Um, because some folks will need to get in the door and other folks are already on board. I'm looking at Zarek on this on this panel, um, but, but I think there needs to be a mixture and that's um, key too. So in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, a couple exciting things happened that I think opened the door for thinking about conflict integration um, in a more wholesome way. And I'll give a little background first. The Bureau for Resilience and Food Security um, has over a billion dollar budget. It houses USAID Center for Nutrition, Center for Water, Center for Ag Led Growth, and then the Center. And in addition to that, um, this is a bureau that originally was set up around the Feed the Future initiative. So beginning in um, 2012, BFS was more focused on uh, agri you know, feed the future and then these more stable and agriculturally productive countries. Um, and this focus, which again was, was on places with greater stability, ag productivity, this started to shift in 2016 with the global food security strategy which elevated resilience and selected priority countries that were more complex, places like Nigeria, Mali, Niger. Um, the Center for Resilience began expanding and the Resilience Leadership Council was also reinvigorated, expanding the number of resilience focused countries from seven to 14 countries. Um, and in this time, we also had this transition from the Bureau for Food Security to the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, which further elevated resilience. And what this meant at the agency is that we were now focused on these areas of recurrent and protracted crises and prioritizing a different kind of country um, in, in a way that really opened the door for different kinds of programming, different ways of thinking and, and different priorities at the Bureau. So those were some of those sort of internal um, changes that were, were going on. Now, at the same time, there were some good talking points that could be made as well, too. So in addition to those internal structural changes and other ones I could think of could be, you know, a change in administration, the Global Fragility Act, et cetera. Um, There's also a shifting global picture that helped pitch the case for why we need to be working differently. So first is that hunger is on the rise for the first time in decades with conflict as a key driver. And the number of people living in conflict is on the rise, too, which I know many folks here know. Um, this has been happening since 2011, unfortunately. Now, the highlighted boxes in red are where RFS has investments. So it became increasingly clear that the places where we work are impacted by fragility and, and conflict. And again, this isn't something that's going to change anytime soon. So now I'm going to share with you the pitch. Um, these are some of the, the talking points that... that um, I share with a broader resilience, food security, water security audience. And I share these because I think it can be helpful to note that um, there's always gonna be variation in how folks regard a conflict integration agenda. And it's the case, and again, because we have Zarek coming next, you know, some folks are on board naturally. They understand that these things really matter. Other folks do need a PR pitch. Um, I think that sometimes there can be a sense that there's 
winners and losers so that, you know, investing in agriculture, for instance, in more fragile contexts is taking away from gains that could have been made elsewhere um, with, with precious development resources. And so I think this is really where it matters to think about leveraging those critical junctures with the right message at the right time. And one thing I've found that's important is to kind of go back to that previous slide to say, you know, addressing food and water security increasingly means leading into fragile and conflict affected places. Um, this is, you know, this, this is actually where the action is for these development challenges. Um, and another thing I try to flag in that bucket too, is that this isn't about the Syrias and the Yemens, um, you know, for, for a development pillar bureau, um, this is actually relevant to your work wherever you are. And I know this is something when we're thinking about that broad range of different kinds of conflict and violence we're facing, um, this is something that, that I try to pitch strongly because I think folks can think conflict integration isn't necessary for them. Now, another piece, and again, I'm looking forward to the Q&A and what folks think about this too, but it's also to flag for different sectors that they're an important piece to this puzzle, um, that people actually don't experience conflict and violence alone. They're in a complex risk environment. They're facing various um, risks at the same time that create a negative feedback loop with each other. And so, you know, to me, part of that pitch is, is letting sectoral colleagues know actually you're, you're part of this and you play a role in creating a bridge to, to those long-term development goals that we have. And then the final part of that too, and I think that this is, um, is related to uh, maybe the concern some folks have about how do I fit into this puzzle? What's my role? I, I try to message that, for instance, with the equities we have in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, we are generating livelihoods and new economic opportunities through efforts like strengthening seed and market systems in rural marginalized areas. We're strengthening formal and informal governance through approaches like establishing local conventions between farmers and pastoralists, supporting water resource management, bolstering ag extension services, which is an extension of the state, um, and then shoring up social systems through efforts like village savings and loan group, loans groups um, and these diverse committee, committees to manage local resources. So to me, you know, the punchline is that, um, you know, th there's, there's a role for folks in these stories, but then this is to me where you then bring in the message of, but actually we need to be programming differently. <laughs> so after you bring folks along, after it's like, you're part of this puzzle, there's a clear role here, then it's about, um, but actually we do need to be working in fundamentally new and different ways. And that can be exciting because hopefully you see yourself self in this story now. So I'll turn to two quick examples that demonstrate, one, um, some of the programming approaches that we've been elevating at the Bureau with that conflict integration lens in mind, but that also illuminate two key things that I think matter. One is to have both light touch and expansive options for folks to be thinking about conflict integration in their work, and then also to have examples that show clear returns for sectoral goals. So the first example um, comes from Northeast Nigeria. This is a Mercy Corps example. Um, Lisa, oh, actually, this is from a different rapid learning series brief, actually, that Lisa was not part of, but um, I, I think this will resonate. Um, this example quickly is about Mercy Corps partnering with a large and innovative poultry breeder and wholesaler in Northeast Nigeria. Now, Mercy Corps supported breeding units in conflict-affected areas and worked with vulnerable households, but they also facilitated village savings and loan structures that strengthened social bonds and psychosocial well-being for the participants. Um, and this was often across group lines. So this activity increased household income um, that participants reinvested in their businesses, expanded livelihoods, there were nutrition benefits, but it importantly found these peace dividends. These village savings and loans groups expanded a range of social um, sources of resilience, they created intergroup contact, they fostered social cohesion. Cohesion. So to me, and in line with some of the findings from folks like IPA and JPAL, intergroup contact alone can be one of those light touch important um, ways that we can be seeking peace dividends even um, across all of our programming and, and even in contexts where you might have the reticent on the design team. But then more expansive example that nonetheless gives those return on investments, and I know that this leans towards Zarek's world, so I don't want to get into this too much, but I'll just quickly share an example um, 
where in Niger with the Terro V, uh, water security and resilience activity under RISE 2, um, there was a really interesting approach that was taken that, again, is, is more robust than just thinking about intergroup contact in an intervention. So I know in the refine and implement phase for this activity, Terra V learned that two-thirds of conflict in Niger was related to farmer and pastoralist disputes. And then at the same time, too, these national rules developed in the 90s to guide natural resource management um, implicit, implicitly disadvantaged pastoralists um, by not defining the status of pastoral lands. And so what this activity did was um, they worked to secure grazing land and animal quarters through participatory processes that brought all users together to agree on how to manage resources. Um, these led to local conventions and bylaws between farmers and pastoralists for natural resource management. And then in different phases of this activity, Tarot V trained land commissions on how to register land property, provided official deeds for land use, and supported new land tenure policies at the national level. So this is that, a more expansive example of where there's this more transformative idea of how we can be pursuing those peace dividends, um, but also you know, by very successfully meeting sectoral goals too. So I'll quickly just mention some challenges and next steps. And I, I think I look forward to this coming up in the, in the Q&A. Um, I think that one thing that we all struggle with, and I know that is sort of an issue overall and at USAID is that we are in this context of limited staff and resources um, and conflict integration is in a noisy landscape of priorities. So there's this question of how do we um, get folks on board? How do we change behavior? How do we have a different way of working when we know that this really matters, but there are these constraints. And so I know for me personally, and I'm looking forward to this in the discussion, um, I'm personally very focused on institutionalizing momentum and capitalizing on small wins in a ways that ideally the grooves in the tracks get kind of like further deepened. Um, and two key ways that I'm thinking about that is, is one, um, humanitarian development peace coherence. So to me, promoting humanitarian development peace coherence is this important way of getting HA and DA folks who have a lot of resources to think about peace. You know, to me, that's just the number one, like one of the, the key reasons that this really matters. It's, it's a way to be further institutionalizing and mainstreaming the idea that peace is relevant for all of us. And it, and it gets folks, you know, in the door that way too. And then the other, and I'm curious about other folks' examples with this too, is how to institutionalize um, some of this thinking so that it feels like air, so that you it's something that you take for granted because it, of course it's there and we know it matters. And for instance, with technical products, um, you know, thinking about things that truly sort of are something that can be mainstreamed into processes like Feed the Future, like the Water for the World Act, you know, companion guides to existing products that can really help folks um, have a have an easy way of um, picking something up and and having something that can be useful when we know that staff staff time is limited um, and and also to be thinking about ways that this is you know for instance we have like a monthly event series bringing in folks that are doing exciting work trying to also get folks excited about what's possible too so thinking about ways that we can be doing that and then the final piece being. For instance, we have a cross-cutting IR on conflict now in the global in the global food security strategy refresh, finding ways to be embedding these things um, across all of our major initiatives. I know that's been a big push this year with the climate strategy, the global food security strategy refresh, um, and uh, the new resilience policy, for instance. Every, every way that we can be embedding this in these broader processes, just trying to do that at every turn. So I will stop there and turn over to the to the next speaker or maybe back to Julie. But uh, yeah, thanks everyone and looking forward to the to the Q&A. Thanks, Jesse. Jesse, for those of you who don't know, has been a huge champion for HDP coherence and many of the documents that that you all have seen um, about USAID's uh, new approaches have um, originated with her. Um, let's move now to the field and let me pass the mic to Zarek Smith, who's the Deputy Mission Director for the Sahel Regional Office. Over to you, uh, Zarek. Thank you, Julie, and very much appreciate uh, co-panelists, both Jonas and Jessica's remarks, uh, as well as looking forward to, to Lisa's imminent remarks. Um, one thing that Jessica said as she was closing really resonated with me. Uh, which is, uh, you know, making a uh, conflict approach like the air 
working in the Sahel, uh, there's a there's really two things that are really distinctive about the air here. The one is the harmaton, right? Seasonally, we just breathe in dust all the time. Uh, there's nothing really that you can do about it, uh, except for on occasion, maybe wear a mask or avoid it when it's at its worst. But the other the other reality, and that, and I think uh, why a discussion about conflict and development uh, is is almost never complete unless you then deal with conflict on a daily basis, unfortunately. Uh, having been working in the Sahel since, uh, I hate to admit it, but over 30 years, uh, starting as a Peace Corps volunteer back in uh, 1989 and witnessing the People's Revolution in Mali that uh, turned into a, a wonderful experience in democracy, which in turn, uh, of course, of late has, has not turned out so well. Uh, and, and seen many, many other uh, trajectories, most recently, of course, the events in Burkina Faso this week, uh, which we continue to deal with um, with a military intervention yet to be described as the C word by the US government. We'll see where that goes. Uh, but in any event, uh, our programming in the region uh, is profoundly shaped by what we know about the conflict environment in which we work. And so uh, it, it's, it, I think it's probably at least as much attributable to mine and my, uh, my colleagues' commitment to a conflict approach uh, that, that we often uh, have conflict relevant programming, uh, but also primarily because if you're not focused on conflict in the Sahel, then you're probably not really actually doing much of anything of, of great utility here. Let me talk for a minute um, about our approach to resilience building. And, and again, thanks to Jesse right. for, uh, for, for setting the stage. In, in, in USAID's approach in the Sahel, uh, resilience building is, is the heart and soul of what we do. And when we say resilience, what we mean is we're building uh, capacity of, uh, uh, of citizens, of communities, and of nations to resist and to bounce back better when shocks and stresses happen. Uh, ultimately, we want to do this uh, to both reduce humanitarian caseloads, which are extraordinarily high in the Sahel, uh, but also to pave the way for positive development outcomes over time. And we're programming, of course, against both man-made shocks, the political shocks, the conflict, uh, uh, democratic challenges, uh, economic shocks, but also quite critically climate shocks and, and shocks that are not at least uh, immediately man-made. These are often shocks that combine. Uh, they happen at the same time in the same places. And of course, uh, the, the advent of multiple shocks layered on each other uh, leads to extraordinarily negative impacts for people in the Sahel. And so the Resilience in the Sahel Enhanced or the RISE program, uh, now in our, its second generation called RISE 2, is our transformational flagship uh, effort to focus on resilience building. And what we're trying to do is layering and sequencing a whole series of sectoral programs against the goals that I've uh, just generally described. Uh, included in those sectoral programs are activities focused on health outcomes, on promoting business development and agricultural and uh, gains, natural resource management, um, uh, water sanitation is also part of it. Uh, and also importantly, uh, strengthening effective governance, reducing grievances through attending to human rights uh, and, and trying to build democracy uh, in, in the Sahel. We have cross-cutting efforts that focus explicitly on the empowerment of women uh, and youth, as we are not only committed in principle, uh, but in fact to the, uh, the prospect that if we are leaving uh, a, a large percentage of the population in the Sahel behind, 
uh, we're not going to be able to find progress on the uh, resilience goals that we're pursuing. So, uh, and uh, next I, I wanted to just briefly mention in this multi-sectoral uh, coordinated set of activities, we are also uh, programming in what we like to re refer to as uh, using adaptive management as a core element. This really means that when a crisis strikes, uh, whether it's a flood, a drought, a conflict or a coup, we are prepared to pivot and evolve our programs. We don't set it and forget it. We don't design a five-year activity that then remains uh, in the same place or treating the same problem set that we identified uh, six or seven years prior. We definitely uh, follow the critical importance of pivoting and adapting our programs as we go. Let me give you a couple of examples, uh, specifically with our peace building and conflict mitigation themes in mind uh, that, that come from our RISE experience and our, activity, our regional activities in the Sahel. U.S. aid supports local governments in order to better manage natural resources. And in fact, again, Jesse mentioned uh, one of the activities that has done this uh, under the RISE to uh, brand. And uh, what we attempt to do, recognizing that water and land use issues underline many local conflicts and that they often lead to uh, profound criticisms of government and service provision, we have promoted what we call uh, commune level agreements. What these agreements do, these, uh, these uh, commune level compacts, are they bring people together, they agree on the timing, the routes, the procedures, and the uh, penalties during the transhumance season. As, uh, as livestock passes uh, through seasonally from north to south, uh, each community agrees uh, and establishes specific routes. Uh, they agree with community leaders and with uh, with those who are passing through the, the cattle herders uh, as to how, how they how these uh, how this passage should happen. Uh, as I said, the timing, the times when uh, particular harvests are happening and when uh, cattle or other uh, other animals are not supposed to be in the fields. And then they also have been able to uh, agree on, the kinds of penalties that might be involved so, such that they can uh, manage those issues before they become a conflict uh, and, and in fact manage them before they have to go to uh, a legal system which is unlikely to treat uh, with any timeliness or with uh, often, often without a lot of uh, justice, the, the relatively modest uh, conflicts that develop at least before they uh, conflagrate into, into bigger conflicts. Uh, another example that I wanted to share is uh, a set of gender and youth interventions. We have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a cross-cutting theme, and so many of our activities have specific focus on gender and youth. And within those activities as a whole, we've trained literally thousands of religious leaders on household and community dialogue, on issues of social inclusion, and uh, in addition, have trained many hundred, hundreds of thousands of uh, community members on issues like equitable workload distribution, joint decision making, and we've established uh, hundreds of youth clubs across the intervention areas. In these youth clubs, uh, young people can engage, they learn pro-social skills, they're exposed uh, to positive role models, and their activities helped, these kind of activities that I'm describing, help to build peace by reducing social tensions, by diminishing uh, youth grievances, by providing alternatives to oftentimes stifling and disempowering gender roles, and also overall by building social capital
that the communities need to be able to overcome both the structures and the proximal drivers uh, that promote violence in the Sahel. Uh, I would mention as well that USAID continues to be strongly committed to learning. Uh, a recent study that was carried out by our allied mission, the West Africa Regional Mission, in fact, uh, found uh, some excellent evidence that bringing people together to design and to implement community level projects, in fact, is a, is a major contributor to building social cohesion. We know that the most effective interventions in this regard are those that require coordination and collaboration among uh, the entire community. And so if you have a smaller set of groups, you get, a, you, you get less results. When you bring more people together with more interest, uh, you get much better social cohesion building, which seems somewhat intuitive, uh, but at the programmatic level, it's not always the easiest to do. Uh, but, so we, but we know uh, that, it, that that kind of effort is really worth its, uh, worth its weight in gold. But even improving social cohesion, while we know it's necessary, it's not sufficient. Uh, it's not going to, on its own, change the attitudes and behaviors that are often related to violence. And so we also know that programs have got to address other factors that can influence the attitudes and the behaviors, including uh, the water scarcity issues, the community management of, uh, of transhumans that I just finished describing or other means uh, uh, resolving or, or putting in place systems that prevent land disputes, for example. And so we have activities and programs uh, that work on land tenure and uh, assist communities in making an official uh, uh, land records available uh, to, to communities uh, throughout, this, throughout our intervention areas. I wanted to um, just end my thoughts today uh, with a, a, a short example, a short story. Well, I've given a couple of examples, but a short story of a particular beneficiary that I find uh, very illustrative and, and, and quite important. Uh, and it's the story of a, a woman from Burkina Faso whose name is Alimata Korogo. Alimata is really quite a remarkable woman. She's unique in many ways, uh, but she's also emblematic of uh, thousands of women across the Sahel who are able to make concrete contributions to both development and peace. When Alimata first came into contact with USAID programs uh, almost a decade ago, she was poor, she was sick, fully dependent on others for her livelihood, and she was also almost, almost entirely illiterate and enumerate. And so the first generation uh, of resilience programming really took a stair-step approach, and it started with literacy and numeracy, of which Alimata was a beneficiary. Uh, after she gained literacy skills, she also gained confidence. She became uh, a micro entrepreneur learned soap making and also began raising small ruminants. She organized her friends and her neighbors. They created a, uh, a cooperative to, to sell the products that they were making. And ultimately, uh, by 2020, Alimata and many of her friends in her community were making enough to pay their kids school fees, pay their medical bills, and to regularly purchase nutritious food for their families. Alimata, in particular, uh, had even bought a motorcycle to enable her to come and go to market more frequently and to, to carry out some of the trainings and uh, organizing that she was doing in the neighboring communities. However, in 2020, the violence that has swept across Burkina Faso uh, came to Alimata's village. And she, along with all of her uh, community, were forced to decamp uh, and move to a nearby town of Barcelogo, a municipal center, 
And they, along with now millions of other Burkina Bay, 1.4 million right now, uh, became IDPs. She lost literally everything. Okay, she lost almost everything. What she didn't lose were her skills. She didn't lose the knowledge she had. And she didn't lose the confidence that she had gained as a result of seeing uh, her resilience in action. And so a really awesome thing is that even as an IDP, Ali Mata has continued to be an, an entrepreneur. She got a very small loan, was able to restart her soap making business uh, and continues even today uh, as an IDP to rebuild the resilience of her community and her family. Uh, and I think she's an absolute uh, incredible example to my mind of why it is uh, that we're doing the work that we're doing and what an incredible and important impact uh, that it has for all of us. Uh, thanks a lot. Julie, back to you. Well, what an impressive story of resilience. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, let me now uh, give you the implementer's perspective um, from Lisa Inks, who's the director of Peace and, Secur Peace and Conflict at um, Mercy Corps. Great, thank you. And I'm just really happy to be uh, a part of this discussion today. And I have the very unenviable position of going last after all of you. And that was a, an amazing story, Eric. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I also think I'm, I'm hoping that in addition to sharing the implementer's perspective, um, I think based on what uh, what you have already said, I'll be reinforcing a lot of those ideas um, so far and talking about what integration looks like for us across different theoretical and geographic contexts. Um, so yeah, I think as, as everyone has established very well, I don't need to tell, um, tell all of you why it's important to do conflict integration. I just wanna mention that this is really seized Mercy Corps because we do uh, work across the humanitarian development and peace building spectrum. And so we really recognize that preventing crises is not only key, but also it's important to work on conflict more effectively and earlier in the midst of crises to make our work easier in, in other sectors. And so, yeah, I'm hoping to, to share a couple of frameworks that guide our work in this integration space and a few examples to go with it and, and then a couple of reflections at the end. And um, I think dovetailing with some of the challenges that you all have already shared. So kind of underpinning our work uh, in this space is we are currently completing a new global strategy at Mercy Corps. And what that is doing is seeking to ensure that all of our programming ladders up to one goal, which is more inclusive, resilient communities. And we do this through working at the systems change level. And so in order to foster that sort of resilience at the community level, one of our four main outcomes is going to be good governance and peace. And so that just, is a recognition that we, we have to integrate peace building work um, more across all of our humanitarian and development work. And we've come to this sort of, it's this, this strategy has been informed by and builds on several years of thinking around our resilience framework. And what you see here on the left is our approach to building resilience in protracted crises. And, um, and, and you can see that advancing peace is a really important part of this um, throughout all of, all of the ingredients. And one of the three most important elements we've identified for success in this space is intentionally pairing short-term violence prevention with efforts to transform kind of the, the deeper structural drives, drivers of conflict. Um, and to the right, obviously a very similar diagram. This is sort of the peace building spin on the resilience framework and on our triple nexus work more broadly. And so what it really recognizes and establishes is that conflict sensitivity is essential, of course, but we also have to be bolder in preventing and reducing conflict and then ultimately transforming those drivers of conflict. And so once you move beyond conflict sensitivity, what we're learning is that you know, what integration looks like, in addition to varying a lot by context and by whatever sector with which you're integrating, it also varies widely depending on what that theory of change is and that specific peace outcome. And I think this this aligns um, 
resonates, I think, with what Jesse was saying that we need to make this manageable and bite sized and sort of integrating peace building can sound and be quite daunting. And so what we're trying to do is break it into the component parts so it's easy to understand what's what specific peace outcomes we're trying to achieve with integration. And so it varies whether you're looking to reduce violence in an active conflict setting to allow and enable you know, development gains to take hold, or whether you're building social cohesion in order to advance other sector work, um, like, and, and Zarek uh, spoke a lot about that, or whether you're seeking to transform those underlying conflict drivers by working on kind of longer term peace and governance work. And one thing we found that's really common across all of these modes of integration and that's really baked into our resilience framework is the importance of incorporating a broad analysis of both what triggers violence and what those structural conflict drivers are. And what this means is inevitably we end up bringing to bear that sort of full toolbox of development approaches, depending on whatever those systemic challenges are. And we see that those tools and approaches then complement and sort of draw on our best conflict management and peace building approaches. So for example, with disaster risk management and climate adaptation solutions, through that process, facilitating connections across groups in conflict. Um, so yeah, I wanna share an example in sort of each of these buckets. And so when it comes to integrating um, programming to reduce violence, you know, we all know this is important kind of stopping the cycle of violence in order to allow other peace and development gains to take root and also to prevent further trauma, further proximate drivers that can derail development efforts down the road and even just prevent humanitarian access. Um, and one example where we've been working on this is in the middle belt of Nigeria. Um, we are for about 10 years, we've built up a portfolio of conflict, uh, conflict management and violence prevention. And one pillar of this approach has been strengthening more inclusive dispute re resolution mechanisms through negotiation and mediation training and coaching, and with a particular emphasis on uh, women and, and young people. And so we, um, in an in a ongoing USAID-funded project, we were able to isolate that part of the program, um, the negotiation and mediation training and see what effect that had. And we'll be releasing this experimental evaluation, but we were, we found that in communities where we, where we implemented these trainings and support that given a year to work after those leaders had gone and started using those skills to resolve disputes, that those communities reduced violence by about 20% compared to uh, control communities. So we know that this type of conflict reduction can work. And, and even in the span of a year, um, and what we're doing to try and really harness the full benefit of that is we're uh, layering that programming on top of our market systems development program in the region. And we have some program specific integration going on as well. So we have a U, an EU funded program that specifically links um, these conflict management methods with climate resilience, sort of recognizing that, that uh, climate change is a threat multiplier um, in the region. And then uh, a second example is around, you know, integrating to build social cohesion. And I really like the emphasis that you all have already placed on this because social cohesion, as you may have noticed, wasn't actually called out in our original framing around advancing peace in complex crises. And sometimes people actually just equate social cohesion with peace. But I think it was like Zarek said, you know, we see this as a necessary but insufficient outcome on the way to peace. And really we see it sort of fitting between short-term violence reduction and longer-term conflict transformation because social cohesion is really what helps those short-term gains in peace stick through better relationships. But it's also what helps communities and governments work together to tackle some of those really thorny underlying drivers of conflict. Um, and then we also know that social cohesion is an important resilience capacity in itself. Um, and I think that's an, that's an area of further exploration of sort of, uh, of research is, you know, what that relationship really looks like. But practically speaking, it's, it's a really nice complementary outcome for development programs and can be more or less sort of easily integrated into existing traditional development approaches. And so um, one example I'll share, it's also Northeast Nigeria, and I'm glad, Jesse, I didn't choose the poultry example. Um, but this is a different USAID funded program, the Rural Resilience Activity, and it's a large market systems development program. Um, and what we're doing in that program is in addition to supporting the private sector to expand into areas affected by conflict by um, improving their conflict sensitivity practices is 
we're also actively building social cohesion among market actors by um, establishing dialogue processes and then facilitating opportunities for them to come together and analyze sources of conflict around markets and then address those conflicts together. And then finally, the last bucket around conflict transformation. Um, you know, this is where we get at those longer term governance and other systemic drivers of conflict and, and again, seek to leverage development outcomes to drive peace. And one example where we've been working on this and trying to crack the nut is in um, Eastern Congo. So we've been building a portfolio of integrated food security and peace building programs. And we're currently at the beginning of a USAID funded program that more or less represents our best thinking to date. And it has sort of three interlinked outcomes right at the top of the results chain. Um, those are increased resilience to conflicts and crises, uh, more accountable, trusted, and responsive institutions, and then finally, inclusive and diversified economic growth that specifically directly improves stability. And that part is really important because that changes how we do economic growth. And this builds off a, a, a program we've been running for a few years, the Dutch funded program where we sort of took a dual approach to both increasing land access and, and were able to double land access um, through mechanisms like dialogue platforms, negotiations, conflict dispute um, institutions, and also improve relationships and, and also help to improve people's sense by about 20%, people's sense that their communities could be peaceful into the future. So that sort of sense of a resilient peace. And so I'll just end by sharing a couple of reflections, and I think some of this may come out in the Q&A, so, so I won't dwell on it too much. But one, one thing I think that we can benefit from and what we've been trying to do is think about which, which sectors sort of offer the best opportunities for this type of integration. And I think climate security is sort of a natural fit where we see climate resilience kind of beyond natural resource management, requiring also some resilient peace building approaches as well. And then market systems development is another, another sector where we see a huge potential to scale and also a huge risk if we don't integrate peace building into it um, because of that scale and, and because these large investments without taking into account conflict dynamics could make things worse. Um, and I'll just skip down to the end. I think another thing just to mention is, and I think this has come out in the discussion already, is that in, incorporating peace building approaches sort of at any level is, is overall quite cost effective. You know, so incorporating social cohesion activities really is, is low budget generally and requires some time and thoughtfulness and needs to be built into the theory of change. But it's something that um, that with a little bit of effort can really enable or radically transform those development gains. And so I think that's something as peace builders we can kind of continue to message. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll leave it there for now and really look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you everyone for such uh, thoughtful presentations and thanks to everyone who has already entered questions and comments in the chat. Please continue to, to do so. Um, let me pose the first question, which I think sums up a couple of different questions that, that came through in, in the chat. Um, and let me ask each of the panelists to reflect on this. Um, and that is that just the instrumental way that we're talking about peace building as something that we integrate into other direct, uh, development sectoral outcomes. Um, it, you know, some, some comments in the chat are that, that we can achieve sort of um, lower level objectives, but are we really getting at the transformational goal of peace building that deals with the higher level is uh, governance issues or that deals with the structural issues um, around which conflict arises in, in the first place? Um, so let, let me open that to um, to all of you for some, some reflection, because I, I think it is an interesting tension uh, and maybe speaks to the need to layer direct peace building programming with, um, with you know, with sectoral programming that that uh, takes into consideration its operating environment. But um, would anyone like to tackle this first? I'm I'm happy to start and let let other folks share smart words. Um, I mean, Julie, you were heading in the direction I wanted to head in, which is that I just think every Every intervention can't have a robust peace building goal, but 
when we're thinking about a portfolio, you know, like a missions portfolio or a broader set of investments in a, in a region, um, there absolutely has to be that mix. And to me, that gets to the HDP coherence work, which is that you ideally need this portfolio that adds up to actually addressing the problem that we have and the core goal we have around, you know, lo solving local problems towards these, you know, goals around resilience and peace. Um, so, so I would personally think that ideally in our guidance, we just have this important range where, um, for instance, with the Tarot V example, there was efforts to work on national level land policy issues that were very important to, to the core issue with this piece of the puzzle. Um, at the same time that you're doing that community level work on the near term day to day stuff, Lisa kind of refers to the same thing, this combination of short term and long term um, you know, drivers addressing those at the same time. So I think it's just important to keep that mix in mind and that one, I, preaching to the choir here, but we absolutely need more standalone peace building investments <laughs> to be layering on top of these sectoral investments while we push the needle on the sectoral investments to do as much as they can to, to produce these peace dividends. And within those sectoral interventions, whenever we can, bumping them up to that systems level. So getting at that land reform, national level land reform piece while at the community level, when it's appropriate and when it makes sense. Sometimes an ag extension service should be a local activity and that's kind of what makes sense, but it, but searching for those opportunities for those higher order governance, transformative systems level things, I, I think is key um, while pushing for more resources for, for standalone peace building work. But yeah, over for, for other folks to chime in. Eric, since you're, you're smiling, can I uh, pass the mic to you for comment? Sure. I, I, I mean, the, this question, you know, it, it gets really to the heart of the matter. And many of the comments in the, uh, the chat box are, are right on point. You, uh, uh, but, but at the end of the day, right, you, uh, you, you're not going to achieve accountable governance without incentives in place for politicians uh, and power holders to be accountable, right? You, and so how do, you, how do you get communities to hold their uh, politicians accountable? Well, they need to be, they need to believe that they have a stake and that, they, that something they say or do uh, or invest might make a difference. And so it's not just about the sanctions that you put or the policy insistence that you put at the highest level, uh, because yes, it's important what the American ambassador and the EU special envoy says and, and what people agree to in an international setting and all those things are, yeah, they're part of the, uh, they're, they're part of the puzzle, but at the end of the day, uh, I think as Lynn indicates, sustainability uh, is not going to come just from high level policies or insistence uh, that, that we respect democratic norms or the rule of law. It, it has to come from communities that hold their own uh, political class accountable. And, and so they, they have to have the power and the ability and the means and the knowledge to do that. Uh, so it's a, so it, consequently, you have to invest at all levels. You can't, you're not going to find success only with a single vision or a, or, or a single type of investment. It's not just about uh, a single sector, which is why we go back again and again to investments that are layered uh, across multiple sectors and that recognize that progress is incremental uh, across lots of sectors. Um, I don't know if anybody of the other panelists wanted to to respond on that, but we do have um, a lot of questions that that go into um, a little bit more uh, detail on that. And um, one in particular particular is looking at the scalability of, um, I guess, HDP or this sort of conflict integration um, efforts. Um, Zarek or Lisa, do you want to talk about? Um, whether or not these things can be done to scale, or if it's really just um, starting in this incubator that happened, you know, all across the Sahel, one big in incubator, of, um, <clears throat> if these can be grown. Yeah, sure. I think this is uh, Lynn's question. It's a really good question. I can start, and then Zarek, if you uh, if you have anything to add. 
I, I think um, first of all, I always wonder um, what we what we are meaning when we talk about scale. And I think that where we can sort of talk about two things, right? One is actually trying to do one thing that that makes a large ripple effect. So right, working at that higher level systems level, that governance level. And I think like Sarah said, that's absolutely important. And the other is sort of replicating very local initiatives across a wide variety of places, but recognizing that you can't that that every every community level intervention needs to be that, right? It needs to be locally led in order for it to, you know, make gains in social cohesion. And I would say I think you know, what we are sort of dancing around is this idea that some some of these community level social cohesion efforts, for example, or efforts to connect local security actors with community members, those can be, uh, again, quite cheap, not to be crass, but th those can be done, um, you know, and added to existing programming pretty cost effectively. And so this idea that you can replicate and bake it into a lot of programs, I think, is feasible. Um, in some cases where we're dealing with large budgets, while you also then work on some of those systems changes and work on the actual root of governance challenges around, you know, building more participation among people, uh, particularly among, you know, women, youth, other marginalized groups. And so I think, again, sort of hitting both of those at the same time, it might not get, you know, immediately to that large change, but it is, it is something that we can measure and work toward. Sarah, did you want to comment or any of the other panelists? I'd love to hear what Jonas has to say. Thanks, uh, Zerk. Just briefly, and, and also scrolling through the, the great list of questions, um, indeed, um, going back to, to my earlier point on, on, on our, our strong emphasis to, to ensure joint conflict analysis as a starting point of, of effective conflict integration. Um, I think a couple of good questions came in that regard. I saw Mike Chechik uh, plead for a focus on, on spoilers. I think uh, a very, very uh, strong point there. Um, that is incorporated in, in our approach for sure as part of a broader um, actor mapping that any programming decisions need to, to consider first and uh, making sure that uh, not just the unintended impact of, of those development programs or other types of, of programming for that for that matter but others um, also consider um, um, the, the spoilers for each of those uh, as well as Melissa's question I think on the future of, of CAF I think also applies to the future of, of our analysis of frameworks in which the unit of analysis has to be adopted rather flexibly um, certainly something we try to do but it's not easy um, because there uh, if you look at a country like uh, Nigeria or a, a DRC of course uh, adopting a nationwide focus on uh, the conflict dynamics in that given country is, is extremely challenging as of course when you're, you're looking at countries in, in, in eastern Africa the Horn of Africa then a regional focus is, is, is a must because otherwise uh, um, you will miss out on, on a lot of, of, of key variables. Um, so we've, we've adopted that more of a regional focus now in, in four different areas, Southern Caucasus, uh, Northern Africa, Horn of Africa, and then Central Africa. So um, um, that has worked uh, better in some areas than in others. Uh, but in some of those, it really helped us to do better uh, joint programming with the member states and uh, the European Union and uh, to share some lessons on uh, the need for conflict sensitivity across uh, the different types of programming, whether they focus on agricultural needs, uh, humanitarian needs, uh, etc. Um, one question also came in through how, how does one um, um, augment these, these development programs uh, to have a peace building effect? I think a quick answer to that, but that's, that's I think many of the colleagues in, in, in the audience uh, for that is self-evident the, the need for a, a theory of change of, of these uh, programming decisions to make sure that the activity is actually linked to a clear peace building objective. And that there's evidence for that link as well, because those are also sometimes created a bit on a, on a gut feeling basis. Um, so um, yeah, I'll uh, leave it at that for now. Thanks. Thanks. One of the challenges or one of the benefits, I suppose, of speaking to a peace building audience is that the questions have gone right to 
you know, how do we do traditional peacekeeping and this integrated approach? But the challenge of this work is really outside of the peace building community, is that how do we bring other sec sectors along? And I think Jesse did a really um, thorough job of explaining how the Bureau for Resilience has uh, has been changing and how there are these moments of, uh, of openings, these political openings, I guess, to, to push the, the agenda through. But how have you all found um, collaborating with other sectors and convincing them that um, even though they are earmarked to address basic education, it's also important to address vocational education because that's where you're looking at potential drivers of violent extremism, for example. Um, what what has been the collaboration across the sectors been like for, for all of you? Uh, Julie, I, I'd love to to just take a quick stab at that. And I, and I can tell you, I've worked at a number of different USAID missions over time. Uh, none of them that I've ever worked at didn't pay lip service to cross-sectoral engagement and uh, recognizing the need to integrate conflict approaches. All, all of them believe in that. And most of them have a strategy that says that. Uh, in, in practice, however, I've only seen it work particularly well when we organize, uh, when we organize ourselves non-sectorally. So currently uh, in, in my current office, and it wasn't my idea, I happily uh, bid on a job and came here to, uh, to carry it out, but we are organized uh, in a technical office that has a health officer, that has a DG officer, that has an environment officer, a resilience and ag officer, and, uh, and we have a common set of goals and objectives none of which are the traditional sectoral goals that also incidentally follow the budget, uh, the, the typical USA budgeting uh, uh, requirements. So of course what happens is uh, pe people are incentivized to do things differently than you would normally if you were a health officer sitting in a in a traditional uh, uh, health office with only one set, of, you know, you have a single client or a single uh, vision and a single focus. When you're, when you're in those more traditional uh, settings, it is much more difficult in my experience to get the kind of sort of natural affinity that grows uh, when, when you're in a cross-sectoral setting. Over. I can. Um, that that's really interesting. And what I'm going to say, I think, is not quite. It's not as impressive as that sort of structural change. But I think, um, you know, part of the answer of how to do this is sort of recognizing what is the source of of resistance. And I think if it's if it's there, there are many sources of resistance, right? But if it's, um, you know, truly about sort of interest and time and not thinking it's important. I think it's it goes back to what Jesse said um, towards the beginning and and that I think you all have reinforced is is really trying to um, work with other sectors so that conflict is at the at the sort of on the tip of their tongue all the time so that they see any peace outcome not as separate from or even complementary to, but sort of essential to their outcomes. Um, and that I think takes some relationship building, honestly, like at an organization like Mercy Corps, it just takes a lot of um, contact and um, discussions over time and, and, and trust between us um, in order to, to try and get that change to happen. But I think another source of resistance is, is just a lack of confidence and skills um, to, to do peace building work and to incorporate it if you're a market systems person, you might not think you have the capacity or can sort of adequately integrate that. But I think, again, part of our sort of work and our charge is to, to help um, distill some of these concepts and also make it clear that they, they're not all rocket science. Um, it's true, you know, you can't fall off a log and do a negotiation and mediation training. You have to have some expertise and experience in that. But there are other activities that are quite 
um, accessible for integrating, whether it's some of that dialogue facilitation or you know, creating opportunities for groups to come together to, towards collective action. Um, and then I think the other thing too, which is really, and it, this, again, it, it, this is something that um, Zarek's team has done really well, but I think building it into the work plan and building it into the proposal. So in a very concrete sort of deliverable sense, it's not extra. I think that's really essential just because of the realities that every single program and every single program team is overstretched. And so um, I think that's, that's a, a basic one that we can't forget. Let me um, build on that point because there are a number of questions um, raised really that speak to the relationship between the donor and the implementer communities. And um, with respect to the donors, the extent to which we're putting um, IRs in our strategies and, and then um, requiring implementers to, to sort of nudging implementers down this path. Um, and on the implementer side, kind of um, getting clear guidance and knowing what the left and right boundaries are with, with respect to their own innovation. Um, so I would love to hear um, from, from Jesse and, and Lisa in particular, but also um, Jonas in terms of that um, sort of partner collaboration with respect to implementation and, um, and your thoughts. One thing, I, this relates a little bit to the last question, but I think it's heading towards this question too. Um, one thing that I think is important and that I, I know Zarek can speak to, but it's this idea that um, it's a little bit silly to pretend that coordination isn't costly and that all of these efforts that will get us to be marshaled towards these shared goals that point us towards, you know, peace outcomes and things like that, to, to act like, um, it, it's not costly in terms of time and energy and, and the, your day-to-day -day job duties. And so one thing that we push for at the Center for Resilience and with a number of the, the missions where we're working is backbone support, that you literally, to grease the wheels on these kinds of things, you need help. You know, you can't just pretend that we're going to stack these things on top of people's existing duties. You know, there's excellent things to do, like what Zarek mentioned, like having these cross-sectoral teams that meet weekly, shared work planning, you know, doing that joint analysis at the front end, there, all these different communication routines, it's all excellent. But to the extent to which you can also have backbone support that links what, you know, those USAID, like that development objective with this region we're working in, and we're actually going to help coordinate actors to be going towards these joint goals in this geography um, and to be doing the learning event, the bringing folks together, working adaptive management around shared problems, you know, like without um, that piece to the puzzle or pretending that's not relevant, you know, I, I think it can be a bit uh, Pollyannish, I guess, to, to pretend like this, this isn't costly and what we need are solutions that address those costs, you know, that, that just engage with that um, separately. And then I, I don't know if this was the thinking with the IR thing, but we, we are trying to, for instance, with, with a cross-cutting IR on conflict with Feed the Future, everyone receiving Feed the Future, you know, investments, the, they'll need to be thinking about conflict integration now in their work. And the next piece to that is having more detailed guidance and, and toolkits and, and actual practical ways that, that we're doing that. Because, um, yeah, incentives also need a playbook, right? <laughs> you know, so it's it's also not very nice. Yeah, it's not very nice to pretend coordination isn't costly. It's also not very nice to say, go off and do this thing that's uh, a, a wholesale shift in how you've been working with without a bit of a playbook. Um, so, yeah, those are two things we're doing. And I can just add a little bit. I actually think, Julie, to answer this question, I have to contradict my last comment a little bit, which is to say um, it is incredibly important, yeah, to build these into our results chains and make us accountable through measurement. But at the same time, we run a risk, or and we, at least as Mercy Corps, we have had this challenge of if a program is too complex and includes too many things and too many elements in, you know, in the um, M&E plan and then it, it really, it, the likelihood of failure is a lot higher. And so I think what we also need to do, like Jesse said, is it requires actual, you know, hands-on support to implement a complex program. And I think, it, I think it does require some sort of prioritization. I mean, we're advocating for prioritizing that conflict piece, but um, when we find we try to, you know, integrate five, six sectors at once and do everything really well, you might do end up doing nothing well. Um, and and then sometimes I think our eyes are bigger than our stomach. So I think just all of what kind of I've said, it needs to be sort of mediated by that reality as well and making sure where we have it built in, we have the support. 
uh, to back it up. Jonas, did you want to share um, from the European perspective? Um, I think the one item that I would add uh, right now is that obviously the, the training component is an important part of this as well. Um, there is, I feel here, a growing appetite uh, among within the European institutions to um, have tailored training on these issues um, so that we reach a, a broad uh, audience. And I feel also um, by making this uh, um, the conflict sensitivity, conflict integration, and, and conflict analysis a, a requirement, um, you can count, you can do the math a little bit. It's like we, we were conducting approximately 60 of these analyses, having approximately on average 30 individuals involved in them. So through this, we're socializing hundreds, if not close to thousands of individuals throughout the institutions that are then moving on to other fragile countries too, the importance of conflict integration. Uh, so that's hopefully a bit of a snowball in, in that sense as well, that that can be replicated in other countries as we are, of course, as the State Department is and, and other countries doing a lot of rotations, because that is, on the other hand, a bit of the downside that we are facing, that we're investing a lot in building relationships with, with certain delegations, making sure that um, um, the planning is conducted in a certain approach, but there's very, very quick rotations, particularly in the most fragile countries around the world. So we have to restart uh, um, um, that that capacity building then again uh, from scratch in certain uh, situations. So that is a challenge that uh, you will likely also face across the Atlantic. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the, the challenges of uh, particularly um, bringing our colleagues along in other sectors. Where do you see the biggest opportunities um, coming up for advancing conflict integration? Where are there either policy agendas or, um, you know, programming approaches or mechanisms or demand bubbling up from the field or even um, for the USAID um, staff, the administrator's kind of directive to double down on our local system support and our inclusive peace building. Are there places where where you see some real opportunities for uh, for the peace building community to kind of push on an open door in terms of, of conflict integration? I'm, I'm happy to start with one, which is actually the, the localization piece. Um, I, I don't know if everyone else sees it this way, but to me, um, localization and humanitarian development peace coherence go hand in hand because the idea is instead of being focused on sector silos and stovepipes with our work, we're actually thinking about what is this locally driven problem we're all going to aim for. And if we're in fragile and conflicted places, the conflict piece will be a big, big part of that local problem that we're now going to aim for in this geography where we're working. So, so to me, there's this way in which doing good work for, you know, humanitarian development piece work, getting the sum of our parts to actually add up to something greater than than these pieces, um, invariably actually centers local problems, local needs, and, and a localization kind of agenda. Um, so in the same way, to the extent that we know conflict is such a core concern in so many places where we work, we just don't necessarily have the standalone resources to address it. HDP coherence, conflict integration, and localization should all converge on these core local pro problems we know we need to address um, in a collective way. So that's my hope. You know, I actually, you could think that they're in, in tension with each other because it's just words we know matter in the landscape right now, but I actually see them as reinforcing. I, to me, localization, HTP coherence, conflict integration are, are sort of hopefully all getting us towards more impactful aid that's more locally driven um, and less sectorally stovepiped. So over. I'll add briefly, uh, I think in terms of concrete opportunities, what I see is, is, is um, within the European reality, a clear um, consensus being built and the nose is going the same direction for the need uh, for this, this um, uh, for uh, improved conflict integration on two specific files, the conflict, peace and, and security combo, uh, as well as uh, uh, any programming on, on governance 
as it relates to the authoritarian drift we see in certain countries, uh, the importance of disinformation, the use of, of hybrid warfare, um, that combination of, of, of challenges. I think on those two that I just mentioned, I think there's a very strong appreciation of, of for the needs uh, for, for uh, integrative uh, measures that uh, ensure uh, um, conflict sensitivity. Um, also, because there's a lot of files in there that where people have to do uh, climb a, a learning curve, uh, particularly when it comes, for example, to, to hybrid warfare. So, so these are, are challenges where, where people are open to, I think, applying these these new concepts uh, more judiciously uh, than than possibly in some some others. I totally agree with those examples, Jonas and Jesse. And I would just add one more. Um, I guess in addition to the Global Fragility Act, which is obvious, but another one I think is um, is the the impacts of COVID. And I think um, you know, unfortunately, and what we've seen is that the imp impacts of COVID on societies have been so dif diffuse and so broad reaching that they do sort of require multi-sectoral response. And one thing I've been reflecting on, and I think we probably all have is, and yeah, at, especially at PeaceCon um, this week is, um, you know, the University of uh, Colorado predicted at the beginning of the pandemic that the pandemic would lead to the outbreak of 13 conflicts. And what we see, you know, two years later is an unprecedented rise in coups and, um, and we are seeing you know, many of which which were at least partly contributed to by frustrations around government handling of COVID and some of the economic um, ripple effects. And so that's in some ways that's that's shrunk in the space for peace builders to work. And but uh, but at the same time, I think it's I would like to think it's driven home the sort of um, necessity of of working across these sectors, integrating sort of good governance and peace building into all of our work, whether it's health or otherwise, so that we don't have these secondary effects down the line. Julie, let me add just one other uh, response that that I think is is maybe maybe as much hopeful as it is a, a real uh, open door, but I do think it's true that, uh, that there is an opportunity for enhanced discourse and, and in fact enhanced practice with our humanitarian assistance colleagues, with conflict and humanitarian assistance. And uh, I, I remember even, uh, even this morning, I was uh, in conversation with a colleague who pointed out to me uh, a podcast by the Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths, uh, that the UN Emergency Relief Co Coordinator, where he makes the point uh, that conflict resolution and res and dealing with the sources of the humanitarian surge needs to be a new focus of the humanitarian community, uh, and that and that is not a by any means uncontroversial. Uh, assertion, and I actually haven't listened to his podcast yet, so I'm kind of excited to have a day off uh, tomorrow uh, to, to, to take a minute or two and sort of listen through, but, but it's certainly the case uh, that our, our, our colleagues on the humanitarian side of the house have everything to gain from our success at uh, peace building. Over. Um, I think that's a lovely way to sum up our session. Um, and I just want to take a minute um, to thank all of our panelists, uh, especially those who are um, awake or, or with us during bedtime hours for their kids. Um, and uh, after the sun has set, we really appreciate it. This is a very important and um, I think emergent topic for, for USAID. And so I'm, I'm particularly pleased to be able to moderate this session. It's one, as we've all noted, that we've talked around for a long time, but that we are now really starting to put into action. Um, and this is not something that any one part of the community can do on its own. It's something we all need to innovate together. Um, and so I thank everyone for your participation on this panel. Um, and I hope uh, that this is just the beginning of the conversation. Um, so enjoy uh, the, the remaining time at PeaceCon and thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>